Christ from this old world to go to when this life's over, and I'm thankful for that for those that are ready. Those that aren't ready, it's definitely this will be the best place that you'll ever experience on this side of the grave. So I want to go there and be with him throughout eternity. That's all the trouble and trials is all around us. Good to see all of you this morning. We said early, earlier we wish you a Merry Christmas. Christmas Eve, and we're thankful for that. And uh, time that's always precious to us. We had a wonderful time here Friday night. The kids done a great job singing. And, just enjoyed those Christmas songs that they sung, and I know everybody else did as well. It's good to see all of you today, and uh, getting ready to go to prayer. If you got an unspoken request, uplift your hands. God bless. A lot of hands. Anybody got somebody you want to mention this morning? Well, as prepared for myself, and I've got a couple of neighbors that are going to Sally, too. She's not well either, so keep both of them in your prayers. Talked to Brother Jakey this morning. He asked us to remember him. Wanted to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Wishes he could be with you. Remember him, Sister Darlene, as well. Anybody else? Brother Tony, also remember Sister Connelly. We, she, really, she got that cold in her chest and everything. She's been in doctors and stuff. So remember her. She's speaking up. Brother Don Napper and his family in your prayers. Lost his daughter, Linda, at the funeral was yesterday. So remember that family. Brother Bob Jack. All of those. <coughs> yes. Remember our home, Brother Tony. Remember my mom and her home. And remember the ones that might not have had a place to get in. Yeah. The ones that struggle through this life. Brothers and sisters. And families that everywhere you need, everywhere you can look. I'm terrible on everything. Well, the Dale's down sick too, so don't forget him. Don't you remember Sister Mary talking? She hurt her knee and she couldn't come out today. Oh, she wanted everybody to remember her. Oh, remember my family. Bless you. service and Helen, his sister-in-law is in the hospital and uh, he's taking care of Isabel there. So that's where they are. So remember Sister Helen. Not sure what's going on with her. I know she's been really, really sick the last little bit. Anybody else? All right. A lot to pray about. A lot to be thankful for. Pray for this service today. Pray for our brothers and sisters gathered all over this world just as we are. The Lord would bless theirs. He would heal. And, uh, let's just pray for each other. We need that. Nothing else? Be everybody able and willing. Let's all bow down. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, Brother Jeff, will you lead us? Father, we come before you this morning. <coughs> I want to thank you, Lord, for this time of year. I want to thank you, Lord, to gather out here this morning. We thank you, dear Lord, that for this morning, God, I walked out on my porch, Lord, and I began to let my mind go and just re remember that as time as we know, tonight, there's going to be a Savior born to this world. Let's come to bear the sins. That every man and woman, that every man and woman through this world, Lord, 
And Father, I pray, God, that this day that as we sit down with our families, Lord, to, to eat and to just give thanks and to be with one another, I pray to God. God, I pray, Lord, we can reflect back on this time and what it means to us, Lord. I pray, God, that you bless the ones that don't know you, Lord. I pray, God, that you bless the ones that don't have a place to get into. Maybe not have food to eat, Father. I pray, God, that you'll just bless them, Lord, that they not have a place. I pray, God, that you don't have food to eat today. There's places set up everywhere, God, for people that don't have, Lord. God, there's places set up all over this world for people that don't have you, God. It seems like, God, they just don't seem to come and attend, Lord. Dear God, I pray, Lord, that you put a blessing on their hearts, Lord, that they might have a mind, dear God, this day, that they might want to come out, that they might want to attend one of these services, that they might want to hear a little bit more about our Savior and why he came to this earth and died so that we could have this wonderful life, God, that set out the Lord, Father. And Lord, the good thing about that is when this life is over, Father, there's a life that's coming that's far better than all my eyes can imagine. It's going to be in a place, as the Bible speaks of, a, a place of paradise, Lord, when we will be in your presence when we leave this place. A place, God, that is where eternity goes on and on and on, Father. Lord, we just can't hardly imagine that in our minds. Sometimes we try to think about it, and, and it just, I know we just touch the edges of it, Father. But I know that one day, God, that we're going to be able to see a place like that, and we're going to be able to spend an eternity living in a place like that. Lord God, on the other hand, there's another place that's going to have people in it that's going to be eternity. God, we hear of how the Bible speaks of it and what it says about it. God, what a terrible place to spend eternity, Lord, when they don't have to, God. When our Savior came back and died and lived and taught so that we could have this little place and then went back to fix a place that the Lord is coming we can come to, God. Lord, put the burdens on the hearts of the ones that don't know you, God. As the families are gathered today, together today, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, just help the ones that might be a coming that might not know you, Lord. That they might just be able to extend their minds just a little bit and think about what this, what this celebration of this day for us is for, Father. Lord God, just bless us all. Keep us where we need to be, Father. Help us, Lord, that you might help us with the battles, God, as they come. Seems like they come so often, and then they're gone for a while, because they always seem to come back, God. God, you're always right there, and we can call out upon you, Lord. I ask you to help us a little bit with those battles, and you do. God, we just thank you so much for being here, God, that we might be your sons and daughters, Lord. We thank you, God, for this day. And in Jesus' name, Father, we ask it all. And amen. Amen. Thankful for prayer. It's always good to pray. Anybody got a song on your mind this morning? Your mind of Lord, feel free.
did. He still came anyway. He knew every word that the scoffers would say. He knew the pain, the time and the place. He came from me anyway. Thank cool.
Yair, let's go Saul, or is that? ago we mentioned here, I think it was on a Friday night, about how that Mary sat there and the book of Luke, it says she pondered, pondered on those things. Only time in the scripture that the word's mentioned in the New Testament. As I began to think about her seeing everything that had just transpired up to that point, nine months before that, the angel coming to her. Going over to Elizabeth's house and experiencing what she experienced there. What was going on there that day, the birth of that little baby Jesus, said she pondered upon those things and kept them in her heart. As we read the song, we refer to it as a song when she began to magnify the Lord's name in the book of Luke. It was obvious that that girl knew a lot of scripture. She knew what the Old Testament had prophesied about. And I'm sure she probably held it a little closer to her and probably studied a little harder after the, the angel came and visited her there nine months prior to that. And I'm sure her heart was swelled up on the inside of her. Bring the greatest gift to mankind that's ever been provided for us, that little baby Jesus. Thank God for this unspeakable gift, one of the writers said. It's unspeakable. We can't hardly describe it with our English language. The Greek language goes into a whole lot more detail with descriptive words than our English language does. And it couldn't hardly describe it. But I'm thankful that God's given us here today enough knowledge, enough understanding, whether you're well-learned in the Bible, or whether you're well-learned as far as the culture and material things of this life are with education or not, he's blessed us, everyone here today, with enough understanding to know that we were lost, that we needed a Savior, and that he provided one for us so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. That that little baby born there provided us a way to escape, and I'm thankful for that this morning, and I know you all are too. If you don't know him, if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to get to know him because you're missing out on one of the greatest opportunities, blessings, privileges that you could ever begin to experience while that you're alive here is to have the King of glory coming down and living on the inside of you. You think what that, that, little, that little girl, she was just a young lady there, young, probably a teenager. She had... God in the flesh living inside of her body there. We think, oh, she's, she was blessed among women. The angel even says, wow, she was blessed among women to be able to have that. You've been highly favored, Mary, to allow this to take place. But you know what? I've got the same blessing right here today. Amen. You that are a brother or sister have that same privilege of having God in the spirit coming down and dwelling on the inside of this natural body of ours right here. What a blessing that is. We ought to be singing that same song that she was singing, magnifying God, that he's blessed us. You've highly favored us. You've loved us to allow your spirit, God in the spirit, to come down and dwell on the inside of these earthen vessels of ours. What a blessing that is this morning to know that he's provided that for us. I'm not going to take much time here. I'm going to let Brother Chris come here in just a little bit. But I want to go to the book of Luke and read just a few few verses here of what that, that young lady began to say about what was going on there that day. The book of Luke, chapter 1, verse 39, is when she begins to go over to Elizabeth's house. And when she got to Elizabeth's house, we could back up and begin talking about what took place with Elizabeth and Zechariah and the 
promise of John the Baptist because it was prophesied that Jesus Christ was going to have to have a forerunner. That there was going to be one come before him to prepare a way for him. And as we see all that transpire and here it came down that Mary was told, your cousin Elizabeth, she's with child also. And after all that Mary was told, you've been found with child of the Holy Ghost. You're going to have a Holy One on the inside of you. And you know what she did? She left where she was there and she headed over there many miles to Elizabeth's house, her cousin, and went there to visit her. Isn't it good to be able to talk to somebody that can relate to what you're going through? She, she knew that Elizabeth had just been visited by uh, something supernatural through God. Zacharias had seen what he saw in the temple. She was told by the angel that, and she wanted to go be close with her cousin there and begin to talk to her. And it's good for us to be able to relate with folks that know what we're going through. And there's times that there's things we may go through that it's hard for us to relate with somebody else and begin to connect because they may not have experienced what we're experiencing at the time. But we may never find a brother or sister that's going through what we're going through on this earth, but God knows all about it. The Bible teaches us that Christ was tempted on all points like as we are. He's gone through a lot that we might be where that we are. So she went there and Mary went to someone who was uh, in a spiritual sense. She was as spiritual as Mary was there and she was found uh, uh, with favor and she was able to understand what Mary was going through. And as soon as she walked through the door there of Elizabeth's house, you all know the story, what happened, her pregnant, that that baby, John, in her, in her womb, began to leap with joy. And, and even Mary, Elizabeth spoke up and, and told her, as soon as your salutation began to, to, to voice in this room, that this baby leaped with joy, filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, right in his mother's womb, John Baptist was announcing and declaring the coming of a Savior. As soon as he walked in the room, he allowed it to be known to his parents that here's the one. Just like he said on that creek bank there that day, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. What a blessing that is. And as this took place and that baby leaped with joy there in Elizabeth's womb and Mary saw what was going on there, she started her, her song and began to praise God and give him glory for what she just witnessed there in Elizabeth's house and everything that had transpired in her life up to that point with being able to be with this child. And Mary said in verse 46 of chapter 1, if you've ever read Hannah's prayer over in the Old Testament, or Hannah's song, if you will, it goes right along. I'm sure Mary probably had read what old Hannah had been talking about that day, that she was blessed with child. Do you remember the story of Hannah, that she was blessed. wanting a child, and she didn't wasn't able to have one, and she wept, and she cried, and the, the old man of God thought that she was plum drunk. She was crying so hard, I'm granting to, to, to beg for this child in her life. But here's a prayer that goes right along. If you go over and compare it sometime when you have time, go over and read Hannah's prayer and cover Hannah's song and read here what Mary began to declare if you have the opportunity to this weekend. And Mary said in verse 46, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Exalting. That was a psalm. She read the book of Psalms a lot. If you'll go look, read some of these words that she's using here. My soul doth magnify the Lord. You know what your soul is? That's your most inner being that he's blessed us to have. That's your emotion and your feeling and what you are. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. My spirit hath rejoiced. She was rejoicing in this. There's all three parts of the man right there. The body, the soul, and the spirit that Mary recognized. And she knew what each one of them needed. She was able to rejoice. She jumped with joy just like that baby in her, in her mother's womb or his mother's womb. John Baptist in Elizabeth's womb was leaping for joy. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. The mighty God, the holy God, she recognized what that he was. Nine times down through this, she's referring to what God has done rather than what she's got, she's going to be doing. 
She wasn't saying, look at me, what I'm bringing forth. She wasn't saying, come look, I've been chosen. But she was magnifying God that God looked at her as worthy to be able to do the work that she was about to do here. She, all through this song, she was giving God glory. Wouldn't that be good for me and you rather than saying, look what I've done or I've visited this one or I've worked and done this or I've done this all down through the week. Wouldn't it be a lot better if, if we just said, look what God's done. Praising God for what He's done. He's saved our soul. He's blessed us with good things. He's blessed us with the spiritual blessings of life far above, abundantly above the natural blessings that He's provided for us. And His mercy is on them that fear Him from generation to generation. She knew a little bit about His mercy, sounds like. From generation to generation. Who, who gets that? Those that fear Him. The whole duty of man is to fear God and to keep His commandments. Amen. To fear the Lord. And to look to Him and, and allow Him to help us as we go through this life. He hath showed strength with His arm. Thank God that His arm's been revealed. Did you hear what Brother Terry Glover preached here the other day about the hand and the arm of the Lord being extended unto us? What a blessing it is to us today that His arm and His hand is extended to us and He's brought the salvation that He's brought within reach of all mankind. That we might through what that he done in this work that was about to start taking place here. That it started in movement. I don't read that he ever told us to remember his birth in scripture. He told us to remember his death. And we find that without that birth we would never have the death that took place on the cross. Nor would we have had the resurrection that take place. As he said himself, I am he that was alive and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. He hath, past tense, hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. God likes humble people. He likes us to be lowly. He likes us to be down on level. That's why John, when he spoke of him, John said that in the prophecy about him, he was going to bring the high places down low. He was going to bring the low places up high. And he was going to make the crooked straight. <coughs> so God loves the humble. He gives grace to the humble, another writer said. He hath, again, past tense, Mary said, hath filled the hungry with good things. That's not talking about what was on your table this morning for breakfast. Amen. I'm glad, as he said in the Sermon on the Mount there, that blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. He's able to fill us up today if we're desirous of it. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich... He hath sent away empty. He hath hoping. You know what that word hoping means? It means help. He's helped. He's a very present help in the time of need. Have you ever needed him? Have you ever needed any help in your life? I sure have. And I've had to call on him many times. And I'll probably have to call on him again before I leave this world. And you will too. And he's a help in the time of need if we'll just trust in him. He hath hoping his servant Israel. In remembrance of his mercy. When we were helpless. When we were without strength. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. When we were in need of a savior. When this world was going in the wrong direction. He sent his son. Came into this world. John's quoted the most quoted scripture that there is. That God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. The gift he gave to us. Romans begins to speak about the gift. This unspeakable gift. And how that we're blessed today to have. What that he's provided for us. So as we go through this weekend. Let's not get so wrapped up in the gifts that we're obtaining. And what we're giving to our kids. But let's be reminded of the best gift that we've ever been provided here on this earth. If we're not real careful, we'll preach against how commercialized and how uh, 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 this, this world has allowed Christmas to get and all this. And if we're not real careful as Christians, we'll get just as wrapped up in all the, the hustle and bustle as everybody else that's around us. And we need to just stop, take time, and begin to be thankful for what God has provided for us, for a people that were in need of a Savior, that He gave us that help that would be a, 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 to us a Savior that was born there in Bethlehem that He proclaimed to Mary there that day. Verse 55, And as He spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever, and Mary abode with her about three months, 
You'll go up prior to this. You'll find she went there in about the sixth month to Elizabeth's house. And she stayed there about three months. So what's that tell us? Six plus three is nine. So she was more than likely right there when that baby John was born. And was able to see what took place with that little fellow as he came along. And then she returned to her own house. And we look down through these scriptures here. We need to be reminded how that God has been in the arrangements. That this wasn't just something that just happened to be. That this wasn't just something that by coincidence took place. <clears throat> it wasn't just a coincidence that that star was in the sky there. That God just all at once put it up there. God had all of this in his mind before the world was created. That we might be able to see all the evidence begin to unfold. And those Jews that were living that remnant. That was living the way that they should have been living. They knew exactly when to be looking for him. He gave us a precise timeline when we look to those Amen. old prophets, especially in the book of Daniel, when you go over there and begin to count those weeks that made to those years that he began to transpire and all the things that took place there with his prophecies that we could go into detail about of which nation was going to come and overthrow another nation. And it came right down to the days of the Roman Empire that Christ was born. What's one of the very first things that it began to say when Jesus was born in these scriptures right here. In the days of King Herod. Who was King Herod living under? He was ruling under that Roman authority. And in the days of these kings. As the old prophet began to declare. That God shall raise up another kingdom. And I'm thankful that he said that it shall not be left to another kingdom. But it will be an everlasting kingdom. An eternal kingdom. And you begin to find that Mary and Joseph. And when you look at their lineage and their genealogy that he began to speak of. Those Jews were very particular and who the third genealogy came through and they were very proud of their inheritance and how that their heritage came through certain tribes that was there. They even recorded it over there in Jerusalem and kept track of who came through who. And no doubt as we looked at this royal family right here. What do you mean a royal family? Yes, and Mary was of royalty. She came out of the lineage of King David of the tribe of Judah. Uh, going all the way back and we can look and see how that God had highly favored that people and praise God this morning here was this a royal little girl there that came out of that line and she didn't have uh, hardly a place to even lay her head that night uh, to have a baby and now you see how God has favored those that don't have uh, he don't look to the high and mighty he didn't come to the rich who did he uh, allow that angel to proclaim that day that the baby had come and the savior had entered into this world he appeared to a bunch of old stinking shepherds out there in the field watching their flock by night taking care of them. They were more appreciative of those people that were over there in that temple uh, taking care of the service of God there. They've gotten so legalistic uh, in that temple and added so many rules and procedures up uh, there with the Pharisee religion that was taking place uh, that it took away from the holiness of God uh, that He had transpired here down through the ages of time. Uh, but He appeared to those little shepherd boys and began to appear. They got scared when they first saw it and said, Behold, I bring you glad tidings. It's not bad news that I'm appearing to you here this night, but I bring you glad tidings of great joy. Amen. For unto you this day in the city of David a Savior is born. Oh, think about those boys out there. They were about to be out of a job in a few years. What were they doing? Taking care of the sheep. That was required year after year to offer a sacrifice up there at that temple to take care of the sins of the people. But you know what? God wasn't going to need a lamb anymore of a natural sort. The baby lamb was born over there in Bethlehem. And I'm thankful that the blood flowing through his veins was the only blood that was able to cleanse me and you of our sins. Amen. And this whole world of their transgressions, he's the only way today. That's why John proclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God, as he was about 30 years old there that day. Point to him. Don't look to me, he said. He said, I, John said, I must decrease. But that one that I'm pointing you to, he's going to increase. He's still increasing today. Thank God for that. He's still adding to his church daily, such as should be saved. And when he returns, he will have church here on this earth. There will be faith when he comes back. 
I'm thankful that I've got a little bit mustered up down on the inside that I've gathered from hearing the gospel message from an old brother that it's allowed me to persevere right on. The gift of God. By grace are you saved through faith. That out of yourselves is a gift of God. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. So let's be thankful for that. And let's be like Mary. She, she could have bragged a little bit if she would have let herself on being the one that was chosen to allow the Son of God to come into this world. And what did she do instead? She magnified God. Gave Him glory. So let's learn a little bit from her. Let's not pray to her like a lot of religions do. She can't answer you one prayer today. Let's not pray to her or worship her because she's no different than some of you sisters here today. And I thank my God today that she knew who she was serving. And she magnified his name. And we ought to magnify his name as well as we go through this life. Be in prayer for Brother Chris as he comes close to that for us. <coughs> Wonderful preaching we've already had. Uh, but Tony could have kept on going. It would have been perfectly fine with me. Uh, the Bible says, Brother James, that time and chance has happened to them all. That's right. Not everything happens for a reason. You're God's right. not up there micromanaging this. Amen. Every war, every earthquake is not something God sent. Right. But when it comes to your soul, that is something that God has a personal interest in. Amen. God does not intervene in every little situation in our lives. And he definitely does not guide every little micro decision of this world. But when it comes to you and your soul this morning, whether you're a Christian or whether you're not, God takes a personal interest. Amen. And he does works, Brother Jeff, designed to reach his people. And I thought about what Sister Rita said. It brings us such sorrow, such pain, whenever we see our loved ones and those we're close to. And they know the truth, Brother James. They know that God is real. They know the commandments of God. They know they should obey Him, but they choose not to. And we know what's going to happen to them. And we know what they're missing out on in this world. And it hurts us. And it's hard on us. But today, God is in this house. And the Bible says if you hear His voice to harden not your heart, as some did in the days of old and the days of provocation, but rather to give heed to the words. For God speaks from heaven. He may not, Brother James, speak with a literal voice from heaven this morning. I really doubt he's going to do that. But he is going to speak to every one of us in here if we will let him, if, if we will open up our hearts. He probably already has spoken to you, a good preaching. But God is willing to, to speak to people. I'm going to read from the book of Deuteronomy, but I want to quote one more verse. It says in Psalm chapter 25, it says that the secret of God is with them that fear him. The secret of God. And that he will share his covenant with them. You know what that means, Brother James? That means that God has communion with people that serve him. That means that God has fellowship with people that serve him. He speaks to people. God doesn't speak to sinner people who are in their pride, who are built up and who are rich in this world. And whether natural money or not, God doesn't speak to big exalted people. But like Brother Tony said, he speaks to the humble people. And if you will humble yourself down today, and this is also true for Christian people, Brother James, if we humble ourselves down, God will begin to speak to us. And he'll begin to tell us what we need. As I said, I'm going to read from the book of Deuteronomy in the sixth chapter here. Brother Tony said that Mary knew those scriptures, and she did. All of those Jews took those things very seriously. Yes, they did. And they were taught very, very religiously to keep those scriptures in mind. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Well, technology. My phone is just shut off now. I have to go old school here. Give me a moment. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that flows with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 
and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets upon thine eyes. Go down a little bit to verse 13. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, serve him, and thou shalt swear by his name. Ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off, off the face of the earth. Ye shall not tempt the Lord thy God as ye tempted him and master. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. And when thou shalt, and thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, to cast out thine enemies from before thee as the Lord has spoken. Just a few more verses here. And when thy son asks thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And verse 8, go back there one more time, it says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and shall be as frontless between thine eyes. This whole chapter, Brother James, is Moses telling the people that they need to not only accept God into their life, but going forward, they needed to keep him in remembrance of their lives day by day. And that whenever they would go up, whenever they were traveling, whenever they were walking, whenever they were sleeping, in all aspects of their life, Brother James, they were supposed to keep God in remembrance. And in our life, we are also supposed to keep God in remembrance, but sometimes we begin to forget, don't we? You don't have to be ashamed to say it. I'll say it. Sometimes we forget and we begin to let the things of God slide out of our lives. We do. If you say otherwise, we want to call you a liar because we're humans and we mess up sometimes. And sometimes we allow these things to slip. The book of Hebrews, I believe it is, says that we should not let these things slip, but that we should keep them in remembrance, lest at any time these things should begin to slip from our mind. And it was so important to God that they would remember His ways. Why? So that they would not sin. Because the Bible teaches us, Brother Daniel, that sin is pleasurable. It says in the book of Hebrews that there is pleasure in sin for a season, but the end of the ways thereof are the ways of death. And from time to time in this world, that sin gets a root in our life. And it begins to allure us, and it begins to draw us, and it begins to seduce our spirits away from God. And if we're not careful, Brother Tony, this world and the devil and the, the pleasures of this sin, they can begin to lead us away from God. And we've all fallen into that pit. If you've been a Christian for more than a little bit, you've fallen into that pit before you know what I'm talking about. But every time, praise God, He lifts us back up and gives us mercy when we humble ourselves. Uh, but the way that God wants us to conduct ourselves is to remember His commandments. To keep them so close to us that they are in our very heart. It says in the book of Proverbs, Brother James, that the word of God is a lamp unto my feet. And if we try to go out in this world and we try to live the way that we think we ought to live on our own understanding, our own judgments, our own ways, we're going to fall short. But if we begin to let the word of God take root inside, inside of our heart, inside of our very soul and our spirit, that's what he said here, that you would love the Lord God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your might, and that you would keep the word that God commands you in your heart very deep down. That's what Mary was talking about when she said, my soul does magnify God, my spirit rejoices in his name. That wasn't an outward service, Brother James. She wasn't saying this feels good to my flesh. This is something that I enjoy. No, it was in her very most inward parts that she was feeling God. It was deep down inside of her. The most sincere part of you and I is that which is on the inside. And outward works of religion will not please God. And coming to church will not please God. And doing anything of your understanding will not please God. But the way to please God is to get him down on the inside. That's what he wants, Brother James. He wants us to humble ourselves. And this is Christians too. Uh, you may think I'm only talking to sinner people, but I'm talking to the Christian church. Primarily, we have to humble ourselves before God. If we don't humble ourselves down before God, Brother Tony, he's not going to bless us. The Bible says that everyone that exalts themselves shall be abased. That means brought down. But everyone that abases themselves, God shall exalt. And he gave them this commandment that they would teach them diligently unto their children 
and would talk of them in all their ways, and even bind them upon a sign upon their hand that is frontless between their eyes, and write them upon the posts of their house. It's so important, Brother James, for Christian parents to raise their children in the faith. It is the most important job in all the church for young people to raise their children in the ways of God. Right. We cannot make children Christians, Brother Jeff, and we're not trying to. We let God sort that out. When they reach the age that God decides they're ready, we let God sort out their soul. But it is so vital, not only to the health of this church, not only to this church's future, but for their souls and their future. It is so important for Christian parents to raise their children with the knowledge of God, to talk about God in front of them, to explain the things of God to them. And you say, well, they're children. They don't need to understand all of these things. They need to be taught out of the Word of God. They That's need right. to be told the stories about Noah's Ark. They need to be told about Adam and Eve. They need to be told that there's a devil and that he's real and that he's an enemy of God. They don't need to be masters of theology, but they need to be taught this word. How, why do you think Mary understood the word so well? How, because she was taught it as a child. How, you know those Jews, they married very young. How, it's unlikely that Mary was any older than 14, 15, 16 at the most. They married so young. How, but yet she still knew the scriptures, Brother James. And it was because she was raised in them and taught them as a child. How, it is so important to teach them to children that when they get older, they may have a foundation of Amen. the truth. It says in one place in the Old Testament to raise up a child in the way that he should go. And when he's older, he'll, he'll not depart from it. That doesn't guarantee that they'll be Christians, Brother James. Right. There's many people, many godly mothers and fathers and preachers and deacons and faithful men and women of churches that raise their children better than anyone else. And those children grew up and lived and died in their sins and are going to go to a devil's hell. That's not what that scripture means. But it means to raise them up. That knowledge, I assure you, will never leave them. They may choose to go into sin, Brother James. We cannot force them to go a certain right. way. We cannot force them to come to church. We cannot force them to be faithful. And it's not the will of God that we try. But we have to teach them. And when they get older, that knowledge will be there. When I was out in sin, I didn't want anything to do with God. I was going my own way as we all were. We all went our own way. We all did our own thing. We all chased after the pleasures of the flesh. And we tried to make life fit our interpretation, our philosophy, our understanding, our paradigm, our worldview, but we still had that knowledge in the back of our minds. I still knew that there was a God in heaven, Brother James. I still knew that he was real. I knew he was going to judge me someday. I knew that I needed to be living better. I knew that I was not where I needed to be. And when you raise children in the faith, they also will know that when they get older. I feel so bad for the children that don't have that. I feel bad for my brother's children. They've got a great dad and great mom. They love them so much. They're very loved. They're very well taken care of. But they have no knowledge of God whatsoever. And it breaks my heart. It makes me sad. Because I know that it's going to hurt them in their future when they're older. They're not going to have that foundation of God in their life. Because they were not raised in the knowledge of the truth. And all of this ungodliness out there, Brother James. All of this gender confusion and stuff. It's even in the schools nowadays. It's so bad everywhere you look. There's filth. There's vile fame. And they're teaching children that these things are not only okay, but that they are good. And that if you speak against them, that you're evil. True. This world has gotten so dark. And you say, well, the world's always been bad. The world's always been dark. It has. The Bible says the world is evil. There has always been evil. There has always been sin. And it has always been the parent's job to raise up their children in the knowledge of God. That has never not been the case. You think Lot had it easy way back there? What about 4,000 years ago whenever he was in Sodom and his daughters were there? You remember that? He didn't have it easy then either. The Bible says that he was living in that filthy times in that filthy city. And it says all the things that he saw, that they vexed his soul. But you know what? Not all of his children made it either. It doesn't say that, does it? It says that he spoke unto his sons-in-law's and told them that they needed to leave that city because God was going to destroy it. Do you read about any of his son-in-laws leaving that city with him? If he had a son-in-law, that means that he must have had a daughter that was married to those men, right? That's what son-in-law means, right? 
But it doesn't say that any of them came with him. Whenever he took his two daughters out with him, it says of them that they had never known a man. They'd never been married. They'd never been with a man. So he had children that stayed behind in that city, Sister Pam, and they died and they perished. How terrible that must have been for his own wife turned back and looked on that city and turned to a pillar of salt. It's never been easy to raise children in a wicked world, but today it's so much worse than it has ever been. We are back in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're back in the days of Rome. A hundred years ago in this country, in the 1800s, in the early 1900s, everything wasn't perfect, Brother James. There's always been problems, but people still respected God. The majority of people, Brother Jeff, still believed in God. God. Most people were Christians in this country, and people didn't do the ungodly, wicked things they do today. But it's gotten so bad today that you can't even turn on the TV without being exposed to the most vile of things. And you can't even go about your day without being exposed to the most evil that the devil has to offer. It is paraded, paraded through the streets. It is exposed to the children on every hand. This world, they want to raise the children without the knowledge of God. That's, true, yeah. That's the reason why people fought to take the Ten Commandments out of school. I know them. they say, well, the, the Constitution says we're supposed to have freedom of religion but not forced religion. Uh, let's just be honest here. The only reason that happened, that they took that out of school, was because someone who did not like God sued. And then a judge had to do what they said because they were losing the ideal of God. We have taken God so far out of our society, Brother James, that it is hurting us. When people don't even know whether they're a boy or girl, that's pretty confused. That's a bad situation. And it all started with us getting away from God. You look back throughout every generation. You look back at all the politicians from the 17, 18, I'm not trying to get into history, but listen, they were all raised with a Bible-based education. They were all taught of God, and most of them were Christians, at least professed it. They studied. They went to church. George Washington, when I went to New York City as a teenager with my mom one time for school, there was a little Methodist church right next to the World Trade Center, and it was original to that place. All these giant skyscrapers around us, and you look and you see just this humble little church among all the towering skyscrapers. And you know what they told us there? They said, George Washington used to visit this church. If you didn't know, our capital was at New York originally. We moved it later. Even that man and all of his might and all of his esteem, he still went to church. And he still had God in his life. He still trusted in God. Abraham Lincoln wrote extensively about trusting in God for his leadership, for the decisions that he made, for how the, church, for how the country needed to follow God. You don't hear that anymore, though, Brother James, do you? None of our modern leaders live a faithful, close walk with God. And I'm not trying to be their judge, and I'm not trying to get political, but what I'm telling you is that our country, our world has gotten so much colder and so much more evil than I think it's ever been in the past thousand years. But the words of God have not changed. It is up to the church. Yes, it is up to the church. The church should uh, be allowing children to be here. I can't stand it when you go to a church and they take the children out of the sanctuary and they take them to another room and they say, well, we're going to give them daycare. We're going to teach them Bible stories. Hey, I'm perfectly okay with teaching them Bible stories. I'm perfectly okay with helping that. But it is so important for them to be in this building, Amen. for them to see their moms and daddies listen to the preacher, for them to see the people singing about God, to hear the preacher. I know they don't listen to what we preach, Brother James. Hey, if you go home and ask them, there, most of these children, they're not going to be able to give a recap of everything I said. Hey, but they will pick up things here or there. I can still remember today things that I heard as a child that mattered to me. That God put an imprint on me. And that helped me get saved later on. God will bless us by bringing our children to churches by teaching them in the ways. And yes, it is to a degree the church's job to teach children, to show them the right way. But at the end of the day, it is the parent's job to train children up. Right. That when they're older, they may know the difference between that which was right and this wrong. I'm not against a Sunday school, but a Sunday school cannot replace your life. Right. It cannot replace your influence on your daughter. It cannot replace your influence on your son. Only your actions over a prolonged period of time will show your children that this is something real. That's right. Anybody can go to church, Brother James. Anybody can become a member of a church at any time. Anybody can have a religion and outward works. 
But when your children, when they grow up and they begin to see the realities of this world and they see that you're different. And they see there's something different about you. That you don't just go to church on Sundays and go to the bar on Saturday. But that you live different. You think different. You talk different. You don't go those places. You don't do those things. Children, when they become adults, they see that. And it sinks in and it shows them that there's something real to this. And if you're not living that way, you're doing your children the greatest disservice that you ever could. Because it gets a whole lot harder to see the truth when you get older. And you begin to get blinded by sin. You think sin can blind you? I promise you it can. In the New Testament, it tells us, the Apostle Paul, I believe it's in the book of Corinthians, he quoted back from the Old Testament about Moses. There was a time that Moses was on the mountain talking with God. And when Moses came down, Brother James, I believe he'd been up there for 40 days, his face was shining. His face was shining so bright that people could not look upon him, Sister Pam. And he had to put a veil over his face like a bride. And he had to dampen that brightness. And the reason his face was shining was because he'd been up on the mountain talking to God. He'd been away from the world. He was getting close to God. You want to shine before this world? Jesus said, let your light so shine that men may behold your good works and glorify God. The way that you shine is by getting close to God, yeah. by staying close to God, by living for God. There's a shine about people when they do an anointing from the Holy Spirit of God. You won't see a visible light, Brother James. You won't see a visible fire, but you will perceive a glory of God upon a man or a woman that gets close to God. Yeah. But this was a natural shine. And he came down, the Bible says that the entire congregation of Israel, they were unable to behold him because it was too bright. And so he put a veil over his face. And the Apostle Paul quotes that, he writes about that in the book of Corinthians, and then he says, and so too is that same veil of Moses upon the hearts of the Jews, that they are blinded from the glorious light of Christ. Imagine being blinded from the glorious light of this gospel. Those of us that are saved, we, we know what it's like to have communion with God. We see the power of God. We see the glory of God. We feel His Spirit on the inside. It's not just an emotional experience. Some people say that. That's what the scoffers, the atheists, all the scientists say. It's not an emotional experience. You think goosebumps automatically mean it's the Holy Spirit? No, it does not. I, you can get goosebumps in all kinds of activities in this world. Hey, my friend, but when you really get an experience with God, hey, there is a peace and a a joy that cannot be measured. There's nothing like it. It's not an emotional experience, but you know that it's God. And we see these things very clearly, those of us that are born again. But those that are not born again, Brother James, they are blinded from seeing that glorious light. What blinds people? Unbelief is what blinds people. In one place, it's Thessalonians, I believe it is, it says that because, and he's talking about a certain type of people doing a certain type of thing, but he says, because they did not have pleasure, but rather they chose not to believe in God for this cause, God would send them strong delusion right. that they might believe a lie and be damned. That's a pretty stout statement to say that God would send delusion to somebody and cause them to be damned. You say, well, God's a loving God. But if you turn away from him when he speaks and if you don't believe in him, that makes him angry. And he's also a wrathful God. He's also a jealous God. I just read it. He says, for the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against you and destroy you from off the face of the earth. He is a loving God. Uh, from the beginning of this world, he looked out and he saw you. He saw your children and he offered salvation to every single one. He desired you so much that he came to the cross and died to shed his blood and to give his body a ransom, a sacrifice for many. And the song the sisters sing, he knew exactly what he came to do. It's true, Brother James. He knew exactly the pain. He knew exactly what and when and how they were going to do it. The Bible says that he stood as a lamb slain from before the foundation of this Amen. world. He knew but he looked out ahead of time and he chose to do it anyways for your benefit. And he's a merciful God at any time a man or a woman will humble themselves. He will condescend to their level and forgive them and lift them back up. So many scriptures come to my mind. Think about old Ahab in the Old Testament. The worst king. The Bible tells us that the worst king that ever reigned over Israel. He sinned so much and he disobeyed God so much. 
And God even said, I'm so mad at Ahab, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill his children. I'm going to kill everyone that pisses on a wall. He's talking about men. I'm going to get rid of any person that could ever be descended from him because I don't want him or his family to be kings anymore in my land. And you know what Ahab did when he heard that? He humbled himself. He humbled himself real way down. And even though he was a sinner, and even though God condemned him, God heard his humble prayer. And God changed his mind. He said, because you humbled yourself, I'm going to extend your days. This was a sinner man. This was a bad man, a really wicked man. He killed people in cold blood. He turned away from God. He built false churches in the land, false pagan gods. And despite that, when he humbled himself, God heard. And today, if you will humble yourself, God will hear you as well. He hears the humble, but he resists the proud, the Bible says. And he says unto them that they would bind his commandments as a sign upon their hand and as frontlets between their eyes, and that they would write them upon the posts of their house and of thy gates. I don't know if that was literal at this time, Brother James. I don't know if God really wanted them to write out commandments and put them on their hands. I don't know if they actually did that at that time, but I know that they did do that in the time of Jesus. Right. You remember that scripture, whenever Jesus said, uh, whatever the Pharisees and the scribes, they sit in Moses' seat, he said. That means that they're the, the leaders. Whatever they tell you to do, obey. See, God wants us to obey authority, even if that authority is wrong. And he says, but, but do not walk after their ways, because they're hypocrites. He says, they make large their phylacteries, and they uh, enlarge the borders of their garments that they may be seen of men. Now, you're probably saying, what in the world are you talking about? Phylacteries, they old complicated word, but what that was is they would take little pieces of leather. And they would write out scriptures. And they would write out this scripture specifically in Deuteronomy 11. And they would put that upon their hand. And they would put that upon their head whenever they would go into church. Then whenever they would go into their synagogues. And they would wear those scriptures on their forehead and on their right hand to show the people that they were obeying God. But the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the preachers at that time, they would purposefully make theirs really big. They would make them real extra large and big font. And the reason they did that is that they wanted to be seen of men. They wanted people to see them and say, hey, these people are religious. Hey, these people go to church all the time. Hey, these people are really living close. And they did these things because they desired the praise of men. But you know what? God does not accept outward works of religion, Brother James. You can do all the good works you want to do. You can donate to all the charities you want to do. Hey, you can embroider your garments. You can make them fancy for God. You can wear cross necklaces. You can do all the outward works you want to do. But if those commandments are not written on your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, if your heart is not right with God, it profits you nothing. We have to have a relationship with God on the inside, Brother James, or it is all in vain. That's right. Amen. And those garments, he said they would make large their phylacteries and they would lengthen their, their garments. That refers to another thing you can go read about in the book of Numbers, but they would take a blue ribbon, a blue thread, and they would wrap it around the bottom of their tunics or their robes. It would be a little bit of blue. Their clothing was white. And that little bit of blue thread would hang out. It would be very obvious. And that was supposed to remind them, Brother James, that God was with them. That color blue was associated with God throughout the Bible. If you uh, read whenever Israel saw God upon the mountain, it says that he stood upon a sapphire stone, the color of sapphire in the fullness of heaven, dark blue color, the color blue. And in nature, there's very few things that are blue. The sky is blue, the ocean is blue, and that's about it. There's not very many things that are by nature blue. And both of those things are representative of great and mighty, powerful things. The ocean is described in many different places. In the Bible as being great, as being deep, as being mysterious, as being compounding of things too great for man, of containing beasts and all these things. The heaven, of course, is a place that we're trying to get to. So the color of blue was meant to remind these people of God and all of his holiness and all of his commandments. And they were supposed to wear it on the bottom of their shirts so that it would remind them. Hey, we don't need to wear crosses and we don't need to have tattoos of God, but we need to be reminded of his commandments daily. We need to keep him in our hearts and we need to keep 
keep him in our mind so that when we go through this world, we do not yield to the temptation that the devil will throw our way because he is going about as a roaring lion, the Bible says, trying to devour whoever he can. He is someone who came to steal, to kill, and to destroy, Brother James, and he puts all of his time and energy into trying to send you to hell. The devil does not want you to be happy. He does not want you and your children to be happy. If the devil had the power, he would kill every person in this household. He absolutely hates us. We could preach on that for an hour, but I don't have time. But the devil spends all of his energy trying to get people to go to hell, trying to get people to be miserable when they're here. He absolutely despises us. And if we want to be strong against him and all of his weapons, we have to remember God daily. And we have to keep his word close to our heart. We have to keep his commandments on the inside, Brother James. We've got to really live for God. If we just try to go through the motions, it's not going to work. We're not going to be strong. And that blue ribbon, by the way, on the bottom of the garments, that's what that woman reached for. That woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. It says that she reached out and touched the hem of his garment. That's what she was reaching for, Brother James. She wasn't trying to get a big old fancy thing. She was trying to get trying to touch the part that in her mind, according to their Jewish custom, she was trying to reach the part that was supposed to be most associated with God. And today, he can still be reached. He's not a, He can't be reached in the flesh. You can't call him up on the phone. You can't send him an email. You can't get a hold of him just because you know me doesn't mean I can get you to God. Just because you know Brother Tony doesn't mean you can get saved. There's no Pope. There's no priest to intercede for you in this natural world. But God can still be reached this morning. And he reached the same way that he has always been reached, Brother James, through faith. When men and women have faith in God and they begin to pursue God and they begin to seek after God, and whenever they begin to obey God, that is when you find God. How I wish that our society would turn back to God. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen at this point. Sodom and Gomorrah was so bad that only judgment could solve the problem. Only getting away from it could solve the problem. And that's still the case. Only getting away from this sin. That's the only way that we can raise the children in the faith. By keeping them away from it as much as you can. By teaching them the truth the best you can. And then trusting and praying to God to take care of the rest. And He is able. He's done it before, Brother James. I'm closing, but listen. If God was able to raise up children, even in the days of Sodom, his two daughters, they still left with him, okay? David had many children. Some of them were really bad. One of them did a really heinous thing to his own sister. You can read about David had some bad people in his family too, but he also had some good ones. We think about Solomon, wisest man that ever lived. And you can go throughout this Bible and you will find, think about Hannah. And Brother Tony mentioned her. She had a child and her by the name of Samuel, and he became one of the most righteous people that ever lived. My friend, God can bless your children in this dark times. God is able to protect them and to bless them. It'll be their choice whether they serve God when they become of years or not. Hey, God won't force them and neither can you. It'll be their choice. But hey, if you really want to give them the best opportunity to escape hell for an eternity and you want to give them an opportunity to get to heaven when this life is over and to have the peace of God while they live, your best bet is to live that life in front of them right here, right now. There's no way you can get around it. You can't substitute it with Sunday school. Hey, you can't go to church once in a blue moon. But hey, you find a good godly mom and dad that go to church all the time that live, live to God's commandments even when they're outside of church that stay away from the filth of this world and that keep themselves unspotted. Oh my friend, that child, they're going to be more blessed than any child of the richest people in all this world. I'd rather have been born by my mom than to be the son of the richest man that ever lived. I'd rather have my mom as a, when I was a child growing up in the faith than I would to be the president to this day than to have this whole world. There's nothing more special than having a godly parent. If you've got two, you're more blessed than even most. I keep on going all day. Go tell me. We'll sing. We'll ask the choir to come up. Chris, stand out front there. Close out.
believe in the Lord, you believe He's forgiven your sins, you're ready for church membership, church doors are open. If you want to come, let us know.
Mine's free. If so, we'll ask you to bow your head. We'll be dismissed, and uh, we'll ask Brother Dan if he will pray this mission for us. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we thank you, Lord, for giving us a mind to come out this morning to worship you and praise you, and thank you for your Son who died on the cross for us that day. Yeah. Lord, we pray that you would continue to go with us. We pray that you would be with the lost souls, Lord, and we pray that if there's any lost souls in the house this morning, that they would have heard your word. And that you would soften their hardened heart, that you would give them a mind and convict them and allow them to come to you. Father, we thank you so much for our brothers and sisters. We thank you for every blessing that you've given us down through this life. And we love you so much. In your son, Jesus Christ's precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.